Welcome back to the ICFJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. I'm Stella Roque, Director of Community Engagement at ICFJ, based out in Washington, DC. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the top winners of the forum's COVID-19 reporting contest and have the chance to discuss each of their stories and what made them compelling. Importantly, before this webinar begins, I want to give a shout out to our judges panel, Jennifer Doro, ICFJ Senior Program Director, Nasser Ulhadi, ICFJ Knight Fellow and co-founder of Proto in India, and David Moss, director of IJNet, for reading through all of our entries in the English language submissions. And importantly, for those of you who are joining as attendants or who are watching this live stream from the forum group, please post your questions to the Zoom chat below or post them directly to the live stream on the Facebook group and I will moderate those questions at the end of the presentation. And now introducing our winners, congratulations to all of you. I'm so happy to have you here today. So our number one winner in the science and health category is Priscilla Pacheco and Alexandra de Mayo based out in Brazil. They worked with a cross-border team with, in Poland and Spain as well to produce a story called Favelas versus COVID-19 published on Outriders. In the transparency, crime and corruption category, our number one winner is Claire McDougall based out in Burkina Faso. She wrote an intense story about um, a UN peacekeeper who allegedly died of COVID-19. And it's a story about accountability, transparency, and access to information. It's titled, In Mali, the first death of a UN peacekeeper from COVID-19 keeps his family guessing, published on Pass Blue. In the inequality, business, and economics section, we're honoring journalist Amir Kafagi. Kafagi. Am I pronouncing your name correctly, Amir? I just want to make sure. It's Amir Kafagi. Amir Kafaji, who's based yeah. out in New York City, and his story, Black Lives Matter on the Pickup Line, was published in Discourse Blog, um, and it's an, a really in-depth story about a sanitation worker strike in New Orleans in the context of the Black Lives Matters protests. So we're going to start our discussion by talking to our science and health winners first, Priscilla and Alexandra out in Brazil. And this is the first time we're trying simultaneous translation on Zoom. So we have Natalia Rio Preto here, who is translating their, translating their responses into English. Um, so hopefully nothing goes wrong technically, but this is our first time trying it. So forgive us if there is any technical glitches that I haven't caught. So. Priscilla and Alessandra, I, I would like to ask both of you, and maybe I'm going to start with Priscilla and then talk with Alessandra. How did you get your start in journalism and how long have you been at it? Oh, Priscilla, I think you need to unmute. Yes, there you go. Bom, é, eu me formei no fim de 2014 é, em jornalismo. E eu comecei, já em 2015, eu comecei a atuar numa agência de jornalismo chamada Mural, agência de jornalismo das periferias. E eu fiquei nessa agência entre 2015 e o fim de 2019, então eu tenho é, boa parte da minha carreira é na cobertura é, sobre periferias, então eu fui repórter, fui do, do grupo de gestão da, da agência também, é, e desde o início do ano passado, 2020, eu trabalho com checagem de fatos, atualmente eu trabalho na, no Aos Fatos, é uma agência brasileira especializada em fact-checking. É, primeiramente, agradecer aí a oportunidade de falar com todo mundo, é, eu queria... Uh, falar um pouco né, sobre como eu comecei, e foi em 1999, já faz muito tempo, uh, eu comecei fazendo revistas de hip-hop, rap e cultura urbana em São Paulo. E fiquei durante 10 anos editando revistas de cultura urbana, principalmente que abordavam rap e grafite, e... Acho que ali foi um pouco da minha grande experiência em rodar o Brasil inteiro e todas as periferias fazendo esse tipo de, de, de trabalho jornalístico, entrevistando e 
falando com as pessoas do, né, de várias partes do Brasil. O hip hop é muito grande no Brasil e, enfim, fiquei 10 anos fazendo isso e depois iniciei um site que chama Catraca Livre, que é um, é um veículo de comunicação focado em eventos em São Paulo, em, em juntar material gratuito, oportunidades para estudantes e tenho trabalhado como freelancer em diversos veículos, eh, como agência pública, que é uma, uma agência de jornalismo investigativo aqui no Brasil, mas também já trabalhei em mais de 20 veículos, publicando nos mais diversos jornais. E em 2010, eu comecei a fazer jornalismo e quadrinhos, eu juntei minhas duas paixões, que era o jornalismo e os quadrinhos, e desde então venho trabalhando em diversos veículos. That's brilliant. Now I'm going to screen share your story here because you chose like a very unique format to actually set it up. It, you know, Favela versus COVID-19 is a multimedia story. And I, I wanted to ask you, I don't know whether Priscilla or Alessandra can do this best. Could one of you please summarize the story for us in case there's attendants who haven't read it? É, claro. É, então, essa reportagem, o foco dela é mostrar as iniciativas é, tomadas pela população da, de regiões periféricas para lidar com a Covid-19. É, então, na ausência do Estado, de políticas públicas, o que é, a população fez para poder lidar com... É, questões sobre saúde, por exemplo, orientar as pessoas a usar máscara, a higienizar as mãos, explicar sobre a importância do distanciamento, é, distanciamento social. É por isso que um dos tópicos da, da matéria é mostrar que teve gente que saiu pelas ruas com um caminhão de som, passando informação, com o um médico do posto de saúde. É, ações é, relacionadas à economia, verificar quem estava é, precisando de comida, então o, o fio condutor de, dessa reportagem é, é o jornalismo de soluções. Quais são as soluções é, que os moradores é, tomaram iniciativa de, de praticar na ausência do Estado e como essas soluções, apesar de serem paliativas, porque a população ela tem um poder é, de alcance menor do que é, o poder público, como essas soluções elas podem servir de exemplos para outras regiões e para o próprio poder público, que tem muito mais força, é, poder agir. Então, eu acho que o maior exemplo são os presidentes de rua, por exemplo, que saíam de casa em casa é, para informar a população, ver as necessidades, esse tipo de coisa. A gente também teve um desafio gráfico, que foi fazer toda a matéria em jornalismo em quadrinhos e contar tudo isso né, dessa forma e adicionar depois fotos, áudios e enriquecer o material. Mas o objetivo foi transformar né, e fazer que, com que todo esse conteúdo estivesse dentro de uma, de uma história em quadrinhos e que fosse de uma leitura fácil. E para isso a gente teve que ir em vários lugares e recolher também muito material de arquivo para que as pessoas se sintam né, dentro daquela matéria, daquele universo. Então foi também muito desafiador a parte gráfica, além de toda a dificuldade de trabalhar ali na pandemia. I'm a bit curious, why did you decide on a multimedia format and not on a narrative format, like a written format or a documentary? What attracted you to doing this more as a, a comic book cartoon, really, than, than doing it as a narrative or something written? É, foi uma escolha do, do próprio Outrider, o site é, polonês. É, antes, é, eu havia feito um trabalho de compilamento para o Outrider. É, existe um site chamado Radar, onde há é, iniciativas realizadas pela população contra a Covid-19 em todo o mundo. 
que eu fiquei responsável por compilar as iniciativas da América Latina. Então, eu fiz uma varredura, não lembro quantas ações eu encontrei agora, mas foram acho, centenas, é, desde o Uruguai até o México, e entre as histórias que eu encontrei, entre as iniciativas, foram justamente é, algumas é, no Brasil, foram é, essas de Paraisópolis, Heliópolis, é, Brasilândia, e a Lola, é, que é uma da, das editoras do, do Outrider, é, ela entrou, voltou a, a falar comigo, porque eles achavam interessante é, ampliar a história, porque no, no radar era só o um resumo, um pequeno resumo de cada iniciativa. E eles queriam ampliar, é, contar mais dessas histórias, e eles ah, haviam se interessado por três, essas três que, que nós detalhamos. E como eu já havia feito quadrinhos com Alexandre de Maio, na época que eu trabalhava na agência Mural, ela me fez esse convite e convidou o Alexandre de Maio. Então, foi uma ideia que já veio do, do próprio Outrider, que já tem é, uma história de fazer, é, uma trajetória de fazer produções multimídia, de fazer é, produções inovadoras, e eles nunca tinham trabalhado com quadrinhos. Então, eles queriam complementar, é, fazer é, reportagens em quadrinhos nessa linha, que já, já com a experiência de fazer é, materiais multimídias em outros formatos, And you guys worked with a cross-border team in Poland and in Spain. What was that like? And what was some of the biggest challenges working with sort of team members in a different time zone, in a different country? Well, para mim, acho que o... assim, tudo foi muito bem organizado. É, acho que quando a gente trabalha numa equipe é, multimídia, uma equipe... É, com pessoas em diferentes países, com diferentes habilidades. É, é muito importante que tenha uma organização que tenha uma liderança, e isso a gente teve. Então, o nosso ponto é, de contato sempre foi a Lola, a coordenadora do projeto, então isso ajudou muito, é, facilitou muito o contato, porque é, era ela é, para quem a gente se reportava. Eu acho que o desafio, pelo menos para mim, é, foi... É, lidar com os diferentes sotaques. É quando a gente é, fez a reunião, reunião é, em inglês, e cada um ali tinha um, um sotaque diferente, assim, para entender, acho que foi um desafio essa questão da língua. É, fuso horário não, não foi um problema, a gente trabalhou, as reuniões eram no fuso horário, é, fuso horário europeu, então a gente fazia reunião, a gente fez reunião quando era parte da manhã no Brasil e tarde, na, na Europa, então da, da minha parte acho que foi mais essa questão um pouco da, da diferença de, de sotaques, acho que principalmente porque ainda não sou tão fluente, mas tudo no fim fluiu, fluiu bem nas conversas, a gente também tinha é, um canal no, aí fugiu o um nome agora, no Slack, é, no Slack que facilitava a comunicação, é, eu acho que a gente teve, é, como o jornalismo em quadrinhos é um, em si é um formato novo para a equipe do Outright, a gente teve que discutir alguns conceitos de arte, de como conduzir a história, e né, com a dificuldade de estar tá fazendo um formato um pouco novo, que precisava de bastante conversas em alinhamentos, essa distância dificultou um pouco essa nesse perfeito alinhamento ali, mas no final tudo deu muito certo, a equipe funcionou super bem, é, mas toda vez que a gente está fazendo, né, um, um, eu tenho feito em muitos veículos jornalismo em quadrinhos, e quando o veículo nunca fez, é, tem bastante coisa para ser conversada e ser acordada, e acho que essa juntou um pouco essa dificuldade de uma equipe internacional e de estar fazendo um formato novo. Mas, no final, tudo fluiu super bem e é uma quantidade de material, pelo tempo que a gente conseguiu fazer, isso foi, foi um, uma experiência incrível. Assim. Brilliant, thank you so much. And we'll be coming back to you later in the webinar as well to ask a wrap-up question. So now I'm going to bring this webinar to Claire McDougall, who's based out in Burkina Faso. Claire, 
tell me, tell us, how did you get your start in journalism? How long have you been at it? And most importantly, how did you end up in Africa? Sure. So I um, I've been a journalist for about a decade um, now. I worked on the student newspaper at university. I'm Australian, so I sort of started out there. Um, and I really love travel, so I um, ended up interning on a fantastic paper in Delhi called the Indian Express. Um, and then I worked on a rural paper in um, Australia in a city called Wagga Wagga, went to journalism school, and um, one of my professors at journalism school was a um, journalist who had started out his career in West Africa, um, you know, and I decided I'd like to follow in his footsteps and, and go to West Africa, so that's pretty much how I ended up there. And I started out in Ghana, was in Liberia for a number of years and reported on the Ebola epidemic there. Um, and I'm in Burkina Faso now. Did you end up learning French as well to get around? Yeah, well, I mean, you d definitely, um, definitely have to um, here. It's sort of a very sort of francophone country and there are not many people who speak English. So I, I have to get by in French. So we're going to share your story here with everyone, just in case there are attendants who haven't read it. Could you give us the summary of the story? It was very in depth and very detailed. I have to say, I really enjoyed reading it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my story was basically about the first alleged death um, from COVID-19 of a UN peacekeeper. And it was an interesting story for me because initially it sort of started out as a um, a story about ritual and um, and sort of institutions and you know I was very interested in looking at protocols in the UN and how sort of like death and the handling of death had changed due to COVID-19 um, but what I ended up finding through contacting um, the family of Carlos Guillen and you know his friends and so on was were concerns about a lack of transparency about how he had um, died of COVID-19 whether you know there were questions about whether or not he even died of COVID-19 at all um, and I sort of started, I guess, digging um, from there and sort of, you know, looking at medical records, asking um, the UN mission that he was on um, questions about, about how his case, particular case was um, handled. He was, um, you know, from El Salvador and stationed in Mali. Um, the UN peacekeeping mission in Mali as a helicopter pilot and it's one of the deadliest missions in the world. So, um, you know, there was, I guess, Having covered a epidemic, um, you know, pandemic, the Ebola pandemic before, I sort of, um, you know, immediately had lots of questions about how um, they were managing this situation in a peacekeeping mission. So something I'm curious about, how did you actually find the story? How did you stumble upon it in the first place and then decided to pursue it? Sure. Well, I basically had sort of found out about reports of, um, uh, I think that there were basically two, the first two deaths, um, you know, and I've always, I, I lived in Liberia and there was a, a major sort of UN peacekeeping mission there. So the United Nations and the peacekeeping missions have always um, interested um, me. And uh, I, um, yeah, I, I just sort of came across it through, um, through that way, and um, and I, um, you know, started talking with my editor about it, Dulcy Lambach at um, at Pass Blue, um, and it, it sort of initially was going to be a very short story, um, and then more and more questions started coming up, and um, yeah, it was um, it was a, sort of an interesting story. I, I w w really wasn't sure how it was going to end, but um, but yeah, it, it it ended up being going from being a short story to being a much much longer story. So. And you, you did this entire investigation from home. And I have to say the amount of detail that went into this investigation is really, is really impressive. How did you manage to do the entire story from home? And importantly, how did you manage to get a hold of the, the few documents that you did? Yeah, sure. So for me, that was a real challenge um, doing an, an investigation entirely from home because I'm, I'm very sort of, um, you know, uh, like to get on the ground, like to meet people face to face. Um, but with the, sort of the circumstances, you know, and the fact that the peacekeeping mission is in Mali, um, you know, and, and the issues with COVID, um, it was 
difficult in the fact that the, the man who died was in El Salvador. There were a lot of challenges, but basically it initially started out, um, I started making records requests with the um, uh, Department of Peace Operations in New York about sort of like the number of deaths, the number of infections um, and so on. And frustratingly, that information isn't actually public. So you have to ask for it um, and continually ask for it. Um, and then I started getting in contact with um, family members and friends of Carlos Guillén through Facebook. Um, and there was a real network of, um, you know, former pilots who had served on UN peacekeeping missions. Um, so I started contacting them. And in terms of the records, the family did have some records that they had, but they weren't complete. And they didn't have certain things like, you know, the original death certificate, um, and other documents. And, you know, I guess I, I kept on asking them, you know, why don't you have these documents? And, you know, the, the UN said that they'd given the documents, you know, they were they kept on requesting from the hospital, but they were just unable to get these um these um, records and other things that I sort of, um, you know, that I did, you know, for example, we used obviously WhatsApp messages between Carlos and his wife, um, you know, in the um, hours leading up to his death, um, where they tragically fell out of contact. And then also, you know, just uh, when when they had the funeral, you know, video footage, um, you know, from family members and friends. So for me, it was a really, um, I guess, interesting way of trying to think through different means of gathering information um, than actually sort of being on the ground. And I think that, you know, I guess the, the you know, pandemic has, um, you know, created all sorts of um, challenges and opportunities for news gathering and finding information um, for a lot of journalists everywhere. I think if I remember correctly, though, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a part in the story that was quite interesting where, was it a hospital official who said they don't issue death certificates in Spanish yet? the family received some kind of paperwork in Spanish, noting his time of death. Is that correct? Yeah, so I mean, clearly that some form of death certificate had been translated into Spanish. And, and that was, a, you know, like a, a real issue. And the family kept on requesting directly from the hospital to have all of his documents. And, you know, I think the thing that really sort of shocked me is you had this family who were, you know, like struggling to access information about someone who was incredibly close to them. Um, you know, and I, obviously there's a part in the story where I call up the hospital and, you know, they give me all of these details, you know, I get to speak to the doctor, um, you know, and they give me all of these details about, you know, like how, you know, he became sick, how he fell ill, even sort of like sent a, a lung scan and so on, but the family still can't get this information. And I think for me, I was quite sort of, um, yeah, I was quite taken aback, um, you know, uh, by the fact that I was able to get access to that, um, you know, information, but the family had been trying and trying and trying and hadn't been able to. Now, I'm a bit curious because you spoke with the family members and I take it you had to have a really a high level of sensitivity when writing the story. Did this story bring closure to his wife and his family on some level after you published it? Did you manage to share a copy with them, maybe in Spanish? Yeah, so we ended up, um, I mean, the great thing about doing this story as well, um, you know, was my editor was very supportive of having it translated, um, you know, into Spanish. So, um, you know, it ended up being shared in Spanish. But I still think that um, the family, you know, um, since I last spoke to them, was really struggling to get those um, records. And, you know, I think you see at the end of, of the story, you know, because there hasn't been this transparency, you know, his wife has all of these questions about, you know, um, was his body even in the coffin, you know, um, and, you know, all of these questions because, you know, they haven't been given that access to information. And, you know, in many ways, when I was speaking with her, it seemed as though, um, you know, they felt like they needed that, that kind of information to get some kind of closure and they weren't being given access to it, um, you know, because of all sorts of reasons. With, regarding how information is handled within the UN peacekeeping system um, and, you know, the, the role that troop contributing countries play, um, you know, in these missions as well. You mentioned in our pre-call that one of your biggest challenges was verifying information for this story. How did you manage to overcome that challenge? Sure. I mean, I think that the story, there are many unanswered questions in the story, um, you know, and I think that we still do not know exactly what happened um, with Carlos Guillen's case. But, um, you know, I spoke, I spoke to a number of sources in Mali, um, 
uh, you know, some of which I, I can't obviously, <laughs> I can't obviously name, but, um, but yeah, basically I had um, contacts in the, you know, some contacts in the mission, um, some contacts in, um, in, uh, you know, in Mali itself. And, you know, having worked there before, because I, I covered the elections in Mali in 2018, I kind of knew, um, you know, who could be approached and, and so on. And, um, and yeah, it, it, it was a very sort of challenging story, but I think in many ways, um, you know, the story is as complete as it is, as we could tell it. Um, and I think that, um, I think that the story is essentially about uh, also about what we don't know um, as much as it is about what we do know. Thank you so much, Claire. And I'll be coming back to you later in the webinar. Yes. And now we're going to introduce Amir, who wrote this fantastic story about a New Orleans sanitation worker strike um, in the context of Black Lives Matter. And it's very reminiscent of the 1968 Memphis sanitation workers strike that took place in, in an era where Martin Luther King was fighting for, for the equality of Blacks here in America. Amir, so tell us your story. How did you get a start in journalism? And I, I noticed on your webpage, you have a particular focus on labor. And why is that? Why yes. did that become your focus? Um, first off, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm really excited about this. Um, so how did I get started? How did I get started in journalism? Um, I would say I started, I always had an interest in journalism, but it was something that I, coming from the background I came from, it didn't seem that it was something that was, um, doable. It didn't seem that it was a realistic um, profession to go into, you know, um, especially with so many journalism, journalists being out of work and so many media outlets going, you know, out of business. So I decided to study urban studies and I had, a, um, I focused on the urban environment. Um, I, I focused on labor and I was really interested in getting, um, uh, getting a foundation in that. So when I did eventually have this idea that I was going to go back into journalism and I was going to try to pursue that, but at least I would have this foundation of understanding how labor works, labor history, urban history, and the urban environment. And then I started, the funny thing was I was taking term papers I was working on in Queens College um, during my master's degree program. And I was, ch I was changing them up after I got the term papers and I would make them journalistic pieces. And then I would try to submit them into um, Jacobin, for instance, or in these times, and it worked. And I, I was getting some notoriety and publicity because of my work. So it gave me the, that gave me the confidence to go into journalism. Labor, is, I come from an activist organizing background. I worked in nonprofits for about 10 years. I worked in, uh, with labor unions and different uh, nonprofit organizations. I was in Occupy Wall Street. Um, I was in a variety of different um, social movements and grassroots movements. So I inherit, have an intris, intris, intrinsic interest in labor and all things social justice. So that's kind of where my interest of exploring how, you know, I feel like labor is underreported. Oftentimes there's not many journalists on labor beats. Um, it's really hard to get good information on what's going on inside unions, what's going on in terms of strikes. So I feel that was something that I can help contribute uh, to the overall knowledge of what's going on in, in the labor movement. Brilliant. And just as I've asked everyone else, in case there are attendees or, or people watching the live stream who haven't read your story, could you give us a summary of what this story is about? Uh, it's a beautiful story. Um, well, it's a story I found. Um, it wasn't why at first it wasn't widely reported. And I often read the uh, World Socialist website because I find it that they cover they have a good labor beat and that's how I kind of stumbled upon that this this was happening. So the story is interesting because it's where class, labor, race, and healthcare all converge. And to me, this was the the story of the pandemic that was often being overlooked. Um, it's a story about sanitation workers in New Orleans. Now um, that were on strike because of the poor labor conditions, the poor health conditions, they weren't receiving the proper PPE, they weren't receiving um, the proper uh, protections that were needed to prevent them from getting COVID. Many of the workers were getting sick with COVID. Um, and it was a story about the history of the sanitation um, department in New Orleans in the sometime in the 90s, sanitation work of uh, the sanitation department was privatized. 
and three companies, private companies, took over the um, the trash collection in the entire city. In New York City, to be a, tra uh, a trash collector or sanitation worker is a dream job for many. You can make oftentimes six figures. You can retire uh, relatively comfortable. You can you have health care. You have um, a pension. It's a very sought after job that thousands of people apply for every time the the um, exam comes up and that happens rarely every few five or six years in new orleans sanitation workers make less than minimum wage it's oftentimes um it's a job in which it's controlled by temp temp agencies if you work for a sanitation company that controls the the trash collecting in the city you will not work directly for that company they subcon the subcontract the subcontract the, the hiring to all to these temp agencies it's a job where you don't know from one day to the next if you're going to be able to work but it's also a highly dangerous job so um the the workers in new orleans were for a long time contemplating forming a union but the covid 19 pandemic really spurred them to action and they took that opportunity to flex their labor power and currently they're still on strike and they're still fighting for um, their dignity. Now, you didn't shy away from a lot of the complexities in the story. For example, the sanitation company is a black owned business. Yeah. You, you noted that in the story. Uh, the fact that they had contracted out, I mean, what amounted to prison, it was prison labor, right? Yes, to try to break up the strike. Um, I'm really kind of fascinated. How did you manage to get into those details of the story? How did you find those things. Uh, did you, and out of curiosity, did you write this entire story from New York City or did you travel to New Orleans for any of it? All from New York City. Um, I, it wasn't, I wanted to go, I, I like to be on the ground. I like to, to see, breathe the air that the work, that the, you know, the, the people that I'm covering are breathing. I like to be and see what they're seeing and be on mm -hmm. the ground and feel that energy. And I couldn't do that. Um, but this was a story that I felt was so important. It was a story that was being overlooked, like I mentioned earlier. And um, I did everything I could to try to bring myself there, even though I couldn't be there. You know, I did a, a immense amounts of research. I did Zoom phone calls with a lot of the workers. And um, I studied the history of New Orleans very intricately. I, I studied the history of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. I tried to put it in that context of where they're coming from, where these workers were living, where the environments they were coming. So I can try to give the reader a sense of what it's like to be there and where this isn't coming out of nothing. This is coming, this isn't coming out of a vacuum. This is something that was building for a long time. Um, in terms of the, that was probably one of the most difficult parts to figure out because this was kind of like a rumor and it was hard to find out concretely if this was something that was happening but I heard it from the workers that they were doing and then it was reported once or twice but I couldn't find out what that company was so I had to dig in into the history of um, of uh, prison labor in the city of New Orleans and in the county the greater county that New Orleans is in um, and I was able to get confirmation from the the uh, the company themselves that that's actually exactly what they were doing that, and they, they did it very briefly, but they, I thought it was ironic that a black owned company was hiring slave labor, essentially to, to break a strike by black workers, led by black workers. And that's something that wasn't often covered in, in, in the stories I was reading. Something else that was interesting that you had also uncovered that this company was paying below minimum wage for the state of Louisiana. Yes. Are they going to face any repercussions or be held accountable for that? Because I imagine they were paying below minimum wage for years before they raised it. Um, thus far, I haven't heard anything in terms of they were going to face any kind of repercussion. The city of New Orleans is complicit in this. They they created the environment for the, the, uh, the exploitation of these workers to to happen. They were allowing this to happen. Since the 90s, these workers were being exploited, mistreated, and I'm sure they were being underpaid. Anything short of a class action lawsuit by some of these workers, I don't know if the city will do anything about it. Um, they, since then, the company now does pay minimum wage. So this, you know, I don't know if it was a result of this story or just the public outcry in general. Uh, the company, in order to cover their own hide, I, they're now 
um, I don't want to say they're doing the right thing, but they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. <laughs> the right <laughs> yeah. thing is to recognize these workers' dignity and allow them to form a union. Now, your story also included some really powerful photographs, like this one that I'm sharing right now on our screen, uh, you know, this sanitation worker holding up a sign, I am man, like very reminiscent of the mm -hmm. Memphis san sanitation strikes. And I think, you know, they definitely understood their history using that sign. How did you manage to get these photos while in New York City? <laughs> Those photos were not mine. That was with the editor's help, and they contracted that out to another photographer, um, and that's how they were able to get those photos. Those they were beautiful photos. I wish I took them myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I would like to, that the idea of the Memphis um, connecting the work uh, that these that these workers are doing, the, excuse me, the strike that these workers are doing to the, what happened in Memphis in 1968 uh, uh, was. I th was something that they came up with themselves. One of the workers, his name was, let me see, I have it, uh, Jonathan Edwards had lived in Memphis at one point. And he under he knew the history of the sanitation strike and with Dr. King. And, and, and that was actually the last public um, uh, speech that Dr. King gave in, to help these workers in Memphis. So they knew that history. And while they were working um, while they were working at the Senate in, in, with Met, this company called Metro in New Orleans, they saw a lot of the same similarities that were happening back then was happening, the exact same stuff, if not worse, was happening now. At least the workers in Memphis at that time were actually city employees. Here, with neoliberalism becoming so rampant, especially in the South, these workers are subcontracted by a subcontractor. You know, there's three degrees of separation between them and the city. Um, so they're, they're not technically employees of anyone. They're considered temp workers. Um, so they, they saw that happening. They saw that connection and it was very relevant to them. It was a living history that they were experiencing as well as with the, what was happening with that time with Black Lives Matter was resurging and all these protests happening all over the, all over the country regarding the death of, of, of Black bodies, right? They saw they were being killed slower. You know, they weren't getting shot by the cops, but they were being slowly killed. Their bodies were slowly being becoming deteriorated based on this job. And they realized that they want they weren't be treated they weren't being treated as human beings. And then I am a man was was the slogan that was used in Memphis. And that was something they adopted for their struggle that continues to this moment. What would you say? was your biggest challenge working on this story during the pandemic and how did you manage to overcome it? I think the biggest challenge for me was to build a sense of place. A lot of the reporting that had happened prior to this article did not give a sense of history or place. I wanted, that's why I feel it's very important for me to be in these places that I report on because I want you, I want the reader to walk with me, to see what I see, to see what my subjects that I'm covering or seeing, and to really get get the essence of of what's happening. I don't like the idea. I don't like to swoop in and do helicopter reporting. I like to build relationships, and I like to have the people that I'm working with on the story actually come and participate in the story with me. And it was hard to do that when you're in New York City, you know, and 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 this is happening in New Orleans. So I thankfully build a very nice long distance relationship with the workers. And we were doing Zoom calls and we were on the phone a few times a week and we were discussing what was happening. And they were giving me on the ground reports as if they were doing, they were doing the reporting on the ground for me. And I was able to, to um, formulate that into this piece. And without them, this piece would never have, have uh, come about, as well as doing a lot of research on just the history of New Orleans and, and where this fits in context to the racial and economic disparities that exist in that city, because this is not an isolated um, event. I connect this to what happened with the charter schools in New Orleans, and they converted many of their schools, if not all of their public schools into charter schools, and the destruction of public housing in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. This all was about the same, the same neo, in the same neoliberal context. They also tried to privatize the water supply a few years ago in New Orleans, and that was thankfully defeated by the public, by uh, public pressure. So there was this effort to privatize the entire city, and now we're seeing people fighting back against it. And I think that's really ad admirable and inspiring. 
Thank you so much, Amir. And I guess that brings Thank us you. to to our wrap up question. I'm going to work backwards, and I'm going to start this wrap up question with you, Amir. What is your key, key piece of advice based on everything you've learned reporting in the past year for reporters seeking to produce this type of in depth story during the pandemic that you would give as like sort of your lesson learned from the past year? I think what I've learned is read read i think reading is very important and, and just staying as informed as possible about everything i think i never know when i'm going to get an idea for a story but i spend a lot of time just reading just trying to sift through a a, a lot of the reporting that's out there already um a lot of times something is reporting comes about they're just one two paragraph snippets of something that's happening somewhere and and you don't think too much about it but I try to read everything. I read like the, the Trotsky, it's newspapers, which do great uh, reporting on um, local uh, labor struggles. I read local news, like uh, we have here in, in Queens, New York, the Queens Ledger and the Queens Tribune. They, they usually do one, two, three, four paragraph stories just on something local. But oftentimes those local stories are uh, a great snapshot at something that's happening nationally, you know, and you can really get an idea of of bigger picture things by just reading those kind of things. So I, I, I've learned to just be patient and read and take your time and, and try to find as much um, input as possible. We got nothing but time now. <laughs> so we can just spend time reading and thinking. And then before you know it, an idea is going to come and, and going to help you shape your story. Does, does, does that answer your question? Most definitely. Thank you okay. so much. Thank and Claire, you. what's your biggest lesson learned from this past year in terms of producing an in-depth story like the one you did that you'd like to share with other reporters? Um, I, th I think a few things. I mean, I think I agree with Amir, this sort of need to be patient. I think that, you know, the pandemic is obviously, you know, still with us and is going to go on for some time. And I think it's just... Um, you know, very important to sort of, I guess, check in with people um, and to really listen to them and their struggles that they're facing, um, you know, in the face of this all. And also, I think that um, an interesting thing for me is like, I think that because as a result of the pandemic, you know, like, obviously, I like to do my reporting on the ground um, and uh, be face to face with people and speak with them. But I think that um, the isolation um, that has resulted from the pandemic has opened up, um, you know, people people open up over the phone in a way that they didn't before, um, it, it, which is my experience. So I think that, um, yeah, don't make the assumption that just because you're not on the ground that you can't, can't report on something, you know, there's a possibility of having long conversations with people um, and, you know, touching base with them and, and just, yeah, be patient and, um, listen to what people have to say and be patient with the story as well because stories change and evolve and um, you know can become deeper as well. Thank you so much Claire. Alessandra what's your biggest lesson learned during this past year during the pandemic when it comes to producing stories or artwork or illustration that you've been doing? Oh you're muted let me unmute you. Oh, there you go. É, a, maior, a maior lição que eu tirei foi que, pelo menos aqui no Brasil, a gente foi possível ir a campo no meio da pandemia, tomando os devidos cuidados e entendendo um novo jeito de fazer jornalismo, né, numa nova realidade, mas mesmo com o padrinho ou né, com o protesto, é, e a campo é muito importante porque a gente conseguiu realmente mostrar o que estava acontecendo e fica um aprendizado também pessoal e humano de ver que pessoas que não têm, às vezes, nem o que comer dentro de casa estão ajudando as outras, estão tomando iniciativas. Então, esse tipo de relação humana, de riqueza humana que a gente encontra nesse tipo de reportagem, é, é, eu acho que é um combustível para continuar fazendo reportagens desse tipo. Né? Era um tema que a gente, eu, eu pessoalmente queria falar muito, então acho que fica aí como dica para os repórteres que quando tem né, o grande, grande motivador, o grande combustível 
é, é a boa história, é querer contar algo que está acontecendo e mostrar uma, uma realidade aí que as poucas pessoas viram. Bom, é, nós tivemos sim, a oportunidade de ir a campo e Paraisópolis, mas também teve o desafio de fazer à distância a, a produção de Heliópolis e Brasilândia. Então, é, a, a minha, acho que o que eu aprendi é quanto é desafiador fazer uma reportagem em quadrinhos nos lugares onde você não pode ir, então, acho que é importante ter paciência e prezar pelo diálogo com as pessoas, é, com os entrevistados, porque você vai depender delas também para enviar imagens, para descrever. Então, uma dica que eu dou para quem quer fazer algo ilustrativo, algo em quadrinhos e não dá para ir a campo por causa da pandemia, é, é valorizar durante a entrevista perguntas é, des, que façam com que o entrevistado descreva a cena, descreva a fez é, uma ação de entrega de alimentos, como que é, como que é o lugar onde vocês circulam, como é feito a entrega, então prezar pela, pela descrição, pedir para as pessoas é, descreverem. É, nessa questão dos quadrinhos, é outra sugestão que eu dou e que eu a, tenho aprendido ao longo do tempo, é, eu não desenho, mas é, eu preciso entender do desenho para montar um roteiro é, que, que tenha sintonia com o que o quadrinista vai vá, vá desenhar. Então, a minha é, sugestão é consuma quadrinhos, consuma é, livros, é, livro-reportagem mesmo. É, por exemplo, nesse momento eu estou lendo esse quadrinho aqui em inglês do Philip Scarzoni, é, tem o, acho que o Alexandre de Maio pode dar mais sugestões, mas é, de Oi Saco, por exemplo, que é, que é uma referência. Então, é, consuma livro, reportagem, quadrinhos, tanto do Joy Saco, que é uma referência mundial, quanto de artistas, de quadrinistas da, da, da sua região. E, é, de tudo, tenha paciência, porque realmente fazer trabalho à distância, reportagem à distância, é bem, eu acho que é um pouco mais complicado, porque você precisa, é, é um diálogo à distância e você precisa criar empatia. Ah, também tenho esse. É isso, muito obrigada pela oportunidade. Thank you guys for this opportunity as well. Um... So I'm just going to give it to audience questions. If you're in the audience and you have a question and you want to type it in on the Zoom chat, please do so now. So we can probably spend the last five or 10 minutes with an audience discussion. Or if anyone is on Facebook and would like to, to give us a question, I'm checking that as well. Please let us know. Let's see. I don't see any questions here. Maybe you guys are so thorough that that no questions are necessary. You guys covered everything in your stories. Oh, no other questions from the audience? Going once, going twice, going three times? All right. Well, in that case, thank you again so much for joining us today and a big congratulations to all of you as our top winners. I also want to give a very special thank you to Natalia Rio Preto, who is our interpreter today from Brazilian to Portuguese. She did a really excellent job and I'm glad that I've finally learned how to use simultaneous interpretation here on Zoom. So just flagging for everyone in our forum, next week we're going to have Dr. Gallet Alter from Harvard University School of Medicine explain to us how the COVID-19 vaccines work. And that's going to be hosted by our very own Vice President of Content and Community, Patrick Butler. So please stay tuned for that. To all of you, a big congratulations again. Thank you so much. And we're so glad that you are our forum members and our story contest winners. I hope you all stay safe and you all continue producing really excellent stories for this year. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Ciao, ciao. Bye -bye. Thanks very much. Bye.